the sun does shine in Invercargill. And I know you are all here today to hear about the fact that you can be rewiring your brain right up until the day you die. Isn't that good news? And you've heard the old saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Wrong. You can. You can be rewiring your brain right up until the day you die. So to understand how this can happen, I need first of all to show you the brain. So we're going to have a look at the brain from side on. The brain from side on looks a little bit like a slug. And looking at the brain from top on, it looks a little bit like a walnut. And you'll notice that in the front of the brain there are two lobes. Medicine calls these two lobes the frontal lobe. So they are referred to as if they are one, even though there are two. Because in the frontal lobe of the brain, they have the same functions. So the functions of the frontal lobe, this is where our intellect is. It's in the frontal lobe part of the brain where our judgment takes place. It's in the frontal lobe part of the brain where our reasoning powers reside. And the fourth function of the frontal lobe, I call it the most wonderful gift that I believe God gave to mankind, it is the will. And the will is the governing power in the nature of man. It is the power of decision or of choice. And when you think about it, everything depends on the right action of the will. The power of choice God gave to mankind, it is theirs to exercise. You see, God is not in every heart. You would never say God was in Hitler or Mugabe or Stalin. No, no, no. God gave mankind the choice. And this explains so much suffering and problems we see on planet Earth. Because when someone chooses wrong, innocent people suffer. It's the nature of the beast. One lady was there with her husband at our retreat and he said, well, if I was the guy up top, I'd get a machine gun and mow them all down. And, her husband, and, her, and his wife laughed. She said, and what good would that do? Then the next crop would come up. It's a choice. And in the human brain, frontal lobe takes up between 33 and 38 percent of the brain. So that would be approximately the front third of the brain is frontal lobe. And science now shows us that the frontal lobe is not fully developed until the age of 30. In many countries, traditionally, young men were not given positions of responsibility until the age of 30. Jesus began his ministry at the age of 30. Florence Nightingale, at the age of 30, she said, away with marriage, away with pleasure. I am now the age my saviour was and I want to work for humanity. And how glad England are that she did because she had an incredible effect on the work that she did and she began at the age of 30. Mind you, she was not allowed till she was about 33 to, re I think she was about 33, 34 when she went to Crimea and did the amazing work there in those hospitals. Why is there a difference? Why is there a difference between 33 and 38 percent? Well, you see, the mind and the nerves gain tone and strength through the exercise of the will. The will is not a muscle, but it is just like a muscle in that the more you use it, the stronger it gets. It's like if someone comes to me and says, Barbara, Barbara, I want my son to come and see you. I want him to come and do your program. Do you know what my next question to her is? Does he want to? <laughs> well, well, it'll be good for him. <laughs> <laughs> you see, a man convinced against his will will be of the same opinion still. It is the will that God woos when he wants us to know him. It is the will and the will only that I can use if someone wants my help. If someone doesn't want my help, I cannot. We had a large health retreat in Melbourne about 15 years ago. A lot of staff would eat at our table and one young man said, Barbara, Barbara, I want you to tell my mother what to eat. I said, no. He said, but she needs to lose weight. I said, maybe so, but I'm not going to tell her what to eat. Huh? He said, but you're the health director. I said, no, no, no. I will, I, I will not say a word. I don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable at my table. He was not happy with me. A week later, she came to me and she said, Barbara, 
I need to lose weight. Can you help me? I said, why, certainly. <laughs> Only when asked. And it is actually the best way to train children too. Let me give you an illustration. Let's say you say to your little darling one, you can go anywhere on this stage here, but you can't go off the stage. What's the first thing they do? <laughs> and they only just put a toe over. <laughs> and then they look straight at you. Why? Is what you said true? Now, if you say to the child, don't go off the stage, mother will have to give you a smack and the child goes like this, the parent says, I'm so sorry you've chosen the smack. Whack! Ah! <laughs> if it doesn't hurt, it's useless. Got that? If the fire didn't burn your finger, <laughs> the child would keep, and the foul of the finger would go off. Pain is a wonderful teacher. Now every morning, I do my high intensity runs up the hills and, down, and I walk down the hills and I notice my thighs are a bit sore. I think it's because Jeremy likes running down hills and I've been running down hills and I'm not used to running down hills. But every morning I do that and every morning I dive in the creek. Now my daughter saw me scrambling through the bush and when she stayed she built me some wonderful little stairs because it's a bit steep going down to the creek and she put star pastes there. Well, one day, in the middle of the day, I needed to go down there. And I went down there and I held onto the star post and, oh, a jumping ant bit me. Oh, do they sting? They're like fire. Maybe you're too cold to have jumping ants. Oh, oh, it hurt, 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 very painful. I finally got home, put a charcoal poultice on it, took all the pain out, and I'm right. But, you know, every time I go down the stairs, guess what? I <laughs> I don't want to touch that star pace. There's a little pathway in my, main, in my brain that says, there's pain there, there's pain there, there's pain there. Now let's say the parent says to the child, don't go off the mat. The child goes off the mat. The parent says, I told you not to go off the mat. The child thinks that didn't hurt. <coughs> don't go off the mat. I told you not to go off the mat. Sorry, that's not good for the camera, is it? Child goes all over the place. Parent says, I told you not to go off the mat. Whack, whack, whack. <laughs> that is the only time that it is wrong to strike a child. And that is in anger. Mm. Never should a child be struck in anger. And you know, if the parent says, oh, you've gone, you've gone off the mat. So sorry you've chosen the whack. Why does the parent say that? No parent likes whacking their child. But do you know, if the parent doesn't do that, they have taught the child to lie because they don't follow through with what they say. So the child got a whack last time they went off the stage and now they're to the edge and they really want to go off but they control themselves because last time it hurt. I, I don't touch that star post any time. Last time it hurt, I, I probably could. But it's dark and I, I can't see if there are any jumping ants. <laughs> Pain is a wonderful teacher. And when a child grows up in a home where there are limits around the edge and there are consequences for going out of those limits, it strengthens their frontal lobe. So in homes where children are brought up with the hedge of safety around the home, frontal lobe strengthens. It's like the mother that said to me, my child is so intelligent. You heard that one? <laughs> you say that to a teacher, what do they do? Roll their eyes. What's the teacher interested in? The teacher's interested in a child that will sit, a child that will listen, a child that will do what they're told. Mm -hmm. So this mother came to me and she said, my child is so intelligent. I said, oh, yeah? Yeah, she's four, but I really think we should get her to read because she's so intelligent. I said, oh, yeah? I said, does she know how to make a bed? Does she know how to set the table? Does she help you in the kitchen? Does she help you put the clothes on the light? Has she got a little garden? Does she grow radishes? The mother did not like my answer. <laughs> Half an hour later, I heard a bit of a noise and I saw the child punching the mother. I said, ooh, that child does not need to learn to read yet. <laughs> there are some basics in life that that little one needs to learn first. It's like my sister, she's a ballerina. She always stands so beautifully. She said to me, my son answered me back once. 
The ramifications were so uncomfortable that that son decided not to do that again. And what that does is that strengthens frontal lobe. The highest function of the frontal lobe is foresight. Another function of the frontal lobe is self-control. Another function of the self-control of the frontal lobe is morals. And so in homes where children are brought up with a hedge of safety, there are limits, there are consequences when the line is crossed, frontal lobe strengthens, that strengthens the intellect, the judgment, the reason and the ability to make decisions. Can you see God designed the brain so that all our decisions are made here? That's why I call the frontal lobe a very good boss because every decision that the good boss makes is made according to intellect, reason and judgment. The back part of the brain is the feeling part of the brain. And the feelings make a bad boss. Feelings aren't bad, they just make a bad boss because feelings go up and down like the wind, have you noticed? <laughs> the decisions need to be made here. That's why that is a good boss. And sometimes there's a little bit of a dialogue, have you noticed? You wake up in the morning, oh, it is so nice and warm in this bed, says the feeling, the feelings. And frontal lobe says, because uh, frontal lobe is foresight, you really should get up now, uh, you really should pray, you really should read your Bible, you really should put your clothes on and get out there and run. Oh, but it's cold. Can you see the dialogue? Who wins? The one you listen to the one you listen to. And then you've come back in, you have more water and you have your hot shower and feeling says, oh, don't do the cold. <laughs> <laughs> Frontal lobe says, you, you really got to equalize that circulation. You've really got to um, close your pores, prevent chilling. Can you see the dialogue? And I'm sure frontal lobe is saying to you, it's only quick. It's only quick. One lady said, Barbara, you say that we should listen to our body and my body says don't have the cold after the hot. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to define <laughs> intellect, reason and judgment and feelings. In a monkey, frontal lobe takes up about 17% of the brain. In a dog, Frontal lobe takes up 7.5% of the brain. In a cat, any guesses on that? Nil? 3%. <laughs> One lady said, oh, not my cat. <laughs> well, if the human brain can strengthen or weaken in the frontal lobe department, uh, obviously other creatures can, though not as much research has been done on others than the human being. So you can see by my illustration that the frontal lobe is a very important part of the brain. It is in the frontal lobe that God communicates with mankind. In Isaiah 1.18, God says, come let us reason together. That's where it is. And when I was 25, I decided to read the Bible. I think every person in their life should read the Bible, God's letter to mankind. I got to Revelation and I got to Revelation chapter 3 about verse 19 and, it's, and God says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, he says, I'll come in and sup with him and he with me. And this used to puzzle me. I thought, how, how does God come in? How does God come in? And I had friends who were Christian and I said, how do you do it? And they'd say, just ask him in. And so sometimes I'd say, come in. <laughs> Nothing had happened and it puzzled me. I, I wanted to know how this happened. <coughs> and then I read a book that explained things. And then I realised that my intellect, judgement and reason were understanding it. And when I understood who God was, what he was like, I realised, you see, I started reading the Bible in the, in, in the Old Testament and there was a story of Moses and if they held his hands up, the battle won and if his hands dropped down, the battle lost and oh, I didn't know what was going on. And then someone said, try the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the stories of Jesus. And I read about a wonderful saviour and I, sur I, I, I surrendered my will, my basic frontal lobe, 
to God. Now stars and stripes didn't happen, but you know I had a warmth and I had a peace and I had a trust. You see, God is a gentleman. Notice what the verse says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hear my voice and open the door, he can't open the door. He gave mankind choice. What a wonderful gift. And he said, and if anyone opens the door, he says, I'll come in and sup with him and he with me. Sup, beautiful illustration of the great God of heaven, the, the intimacy in which he wants to know human beings. It's such a very personal thing. It's actually not in cathedrals. It's not in great things. It's just a very personal thing. A human being wanting to know God. It's that simple. Now as time went on, I noticed that things changed. I actually didn't want to smoke marijuana anymore. I didn't want to drink alcohol anymore. And about a two weeks later, someone swore and I thought, oh dear, I was saying those very things three weeks ago. And I noticed a change. And then I saw in Ezekiel 36, 26, where God says, I will take away your heart of stone and I'll give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you. God does a heart transplant. It's such an amazing thing. Spiritual things are hard to put in, in the nitty gritty nut and bolts of flesh and bones. But as I understood how the brain works, as I understood that in that front part is the frontal lobe, and as I read in the Bible, God says that he wants to write his name in our forehead, I thought, oh, <laughs> maybe I'm a bit slow. That's what it's all about. And inside that brain, there are nerves. In fact, our brain cell looks like this. And our brain cell is different to any other cell because it communicates with each other via little chemical messengers. These are the receiving stations. They're called the dendrites. The messages come down here into little filaments, into little boutons, and then they release out and communicate with the dendrites or the receiving stations of the next nerve cell. We have one trillion of those in our brain. So the messages come in, they're encapsulated, they come down the arm in their little capsule form into the little boutons and then they're released out to the next boutons. That's how it all happens. That's how the nerve cells worked. And we as human beings develop habits, yeah? <laughs> I am in the habit of washing my hands after I go to the bathroom. And if I go in the bush, I'm going like this. And I'll go and wash my hands in the creek, but that's rare. Mostly I'm civilised. It's a habit. It's a habit. And if I don't do it, it's like something's crying into my brain. What's going on? I'm also in the habit of cleaning my teeth every night before I go to bed. It's just a habit. Now our habits can be our best friends or they can be our worst enemies. And I was in some very bad habits before I became a Christian. And then God gave me a new mind and a new heart. And I don't know how all that happens, <laughs> but it does. And I started to form some new habits. Basically, I was rewiring my brain. God gives us choice. So we have the choice whether we want to do it or not. And so I started to form new habits. So I'm going to give you an illustration of, um, of, of how this happens. So let's give the illustration, and I'm going to give the illustration of a lady who used to get panic attacks. Notice what I said? Used to get panic attacks. And she had a really strong panic attack pathway there. And she came to our health retreat. And she said, oh, I have to tell you, I get panic attacks. Do you know you can't? You actually can't just get a panic attack. So what I did was I put my detective hat on. We should all be private investigators investigating why these things are so. I said, tell me when you got your first panic attack. She said, oh, a guy at work was diddling the books and I blew the whistle on him. That night I got a brick through my front window. Whoa, she panicked. Do you know that's a very normal thing to do? In fact, if she didn't panic and run out the back door, another brick might have come in and hit her in the head. You see, sometimes a panic is a very real uh, and uh, normal and understandable 
uh, reaction. But can you see what it did? It made a strong pathway in her brain. So the next time something stressful happened, where are her feelings going to go? Down that strong pathway. And it got to the point where she was panicking nearly every day. So, she, so her mother said, you've got to do something about this. You've got to go to the psychiatrist. She told the psychiatrist what was happening. He said, ah, you get panic attacks. What did that do to the pathway? Put a bit of Rio into it. He made another pathway. He said, you'll be on panic attack medication for the rest of your life. Her mother said, what did he say? He said, I get panic attacks. Ooh, a bit more rare there. He said, I'll be on panic attack medication for the rest of my life. Can you see these are physical pathways in our brain and the more we go down them, the stronger they get. So when she came to me, I said, a few questions. Do you live in the house still? No. Is the man still around? No. So what does intellect, judgment and reason declare? No need to panic. Can you see that? No need to panic. But she's panicking. Do you know there are many people who they're out of the trauma, they're out of the terrible situation, but they're still living it. Do you find that? They're still living it. Because there's a very strong pathway there. I said to her, I believe that you can overcome your panic attack. What did I do when I said that? I started another pathway. I said, I believe eventually you'll be able to get off your medication. I started another pathway. Do you think she liked that? Oh, she loved it. I've never met anyone who likes being on medication. But what's going to happen the first time she goes through a stressful situation? Where are her feelings going to go? Down that great big pathway. So I made a prescription of what to do when the lightning strikes. I don't like the word panic attack. Let's say lightning strikes. I said the first time or you know, after leaving our program, if you come across something and you feel a panic attack coming, I want you to laugh. Oh, she said, I will not feel like laughing. I said, remember, that's your wild horse. That's your wild horse. That's what feelings are. They're wild horses. And they need the border senses. That's your, that's your frontal lobe. She said, I won't feel like laughing. I said, that's right, you won't. But you'll be able to laugh. What did I do then? I made a you'll be able to laugh pathway. What's the old saying? If you say you can, you will. And if you say you can't, you're right. <laughs> you won't. I said, and while you're laughing, ho, 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 just pretend to be a kookaburra. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. And while you're ho, ho, hoing, get a crystal of Celtic salt, put it on your tongue, three magnesiums, relax. Drink a glass of water, our brains are hydroelectricity. Put the kettle on. Get a chamomile tea bag. Chamomile, mild tranquilizer. I said, I'm warning you, your body will be screaming at you. Go down the pathway. Go down the pathway. Just ignore it. Just ignore it. That's what your feelings will be saying. Go down that pathway. Frontal lobe says, no. Nah. She drank the chamomile tea. Meanwhile, she did some stretches, went outside, deep breathing, deep breathing calms. Oh, how excited was she when she conquered her first panic attack. And when she conquered her first panic attack, the pathway got a little bit stronger. How long does it take before this pathway here gets bigger than that pathway? And by the way, the good news is that as that pathway is not frequented, that pathway reduces. How long does it take before the new pathway is bigger than the old one? 21 days. 21 days of going down the new pathway and 21 days of not going down the old pathway, it gets thinner and thinner and thinner. The first time will be the most difficult because her body will be screaming at her. That's the feelings. Your feelings are like a wild horse. But we had a board of senses. This is our board of critiques. It's like me saying to a man, can you take this wild horse for a ride? But just please come back in half an hour. He comes back five hours later. I say, what happened? I asked you to do it for half an hour. He said, oh, the horse wanted to go here. I want to go up there. I want to go down there. And what's my answer? What do you think the bridle's for, mate? Huh? <laughs> Whoa, up. 
<laughs> we have a bridle. There it is. <laughs> Feelings are not bad. They're only bad if they're the boss. And I was so excited when I found two Psalms that talk about the bridle. One is Psalm 16, verse 7. It says, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night season. Early this morning, in the night, my reins were instructing me as to what to speak about today. My reins, that's where God communicates with man. The other verse is in... Psalm 39, verse 1, it says, I will take heed to my ways that I earn not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle. <laughs> there it is. How do you do it? It's right there. And in this afternoon's lectures, I'll explore that a little bit more detail as well. This lady rewired her brain. It was 21 days before if she went through a stressful situation, she didn't Think about it. She just automatically went down the new pathway. And remember what the science shows? We can be rewiring our brain right up until the day we die. Some people say, Barbara, you must have a very good memory. I've got a terrible memory. I'm trying very hard to remember your names. I'm having, I'm having a bit of trouble. And Joshua played some beautiful music this morning. Do you think he started playing that piano yesterday? No. Well, I didn't read Psalm 39 this morning, okay? <laughs> Might be quicker for you. It takes me about 21 days. I go over it and 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 over it. For Joshua to be able to play like that, he had to go over it, over it, over it. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. So memorizing scripture, playing the piano, Learning a new language. You don't hear the new language and just know it, do you? It's just the, it's the same process. We have more say than we think over the pathways in our brains. And it's exciting to note that if I wanted to, I could play like Joshua or the ladies that played. But I don't because I just actually don't have the time to put in to what I've got to do to do it. You see, the pauper in the street and the king on the throne have the same amount of time. What are you doing with your time? Now, for me to be able to wake up at five, and I came out to walk at six and I went back in because it's pitch black. <laughs> and I came out at half past six and it's still black. And I went and got my trusty friend called Jeremy, who's seven, I said, do you think we can do it, mate? He said, yeah. <laughs> and we could, and the sun, the sun was just rising. For me to be able to do that, I have to eat breakfast like a king yesterday. I have to eat lunch like a queen yesterday. I have to eat tea like a pauper yesterday. And I have to go to bed early. And then I can get up early. Then I can spend time in the quiet allowing God to instruct my reins to instruct me. And then, can you see that? You've got to go back. In fact, today we are planning tomorrow. And where does all that happen? In foresight. So you can rewire your brain right up until the day you die. But something's happening. Something's happening that's causing a compromise of the frontal lobe so people actually don't have the control that they would like to and that they could have. What it is, is bad air. Some people leave the window shut all night. It's true. Are your windows open? Are you getting that fresh air in? If you don't, when you wake up in the morning, you know you're breathing your own waste. That's a bit scary, isn't it? <laughs> Check your pillows. How long this, days like this you put your quilts and your pillows out in the sun? Make sure where you sleep has fresh air. Sunshine. I'm sure we'll be able to run out there when this lecture finishes. Make sure you get sun every day. You see, do you know what the sunshine does? It goes through neurochemical pathways in your eyes to your brain and helps your brain function properly. Temperance. What's temperance? Temperance means not taking anything into the body that will harm it and taking in moderation the good things. Well, what will harm it? Sugar. Oh, surely not. Surely not. <laughs> surely not. 
I'm referring to the pure crystallised acid that's been extracted from the sugarcane plant. To know how this compromises frontal lobe, we need to know that your brain consumes 15 times the fuel of any other cell. And your brain can only hold a two minute supply. Have you noticed that when someone puts on, say, 50, 80 kilos, their brain doesn't get bigger or their head doesn't get bigger because there's no room in there? <laughs> there's a brain, there's all, can't put fat on in the brain. And so you've only got a two minute supply in your brain. So when the pure crystallised acid from the sugarcane plant goes in, blood glucose levels rise. Does that mean intellect, judgment and reason rise? No, they're bypassed. It's like trying to control a fast car. Then very quickly, the brain says to the pancreas, quick, release insulin, get it down. So too much insulin's released. Where's it going now? Too low. How's intellect, judgment and reason down there? Ah, uh, lights are on, but no one's home. Hmm? How long does it take before lights are on and no one's home? Ah, uh, two minutes. That's why... One of the books we have in our health centre is called Sugar Blues, because sugar causes the blues. And we'll look at that again this afternoon when we look at depression, being able to safeguard against depression. People say to me, Barbara, you homeschooled your children. I had six, and then I married Michael 20 years ago, and he had two, so eight. How can you stand having your children around you all the day? Do you know it's easy when you don't give them sugar? Mm -hmm. Caffeine, oh surely not. How does caffeine interfere with the functioning of the frontal lobe? Well caffeine interferes with the neurotransmitters in the brain. We've got a book in the library in our health centre called Caffeine Blues and he likens having a cup of coffee so you're walking along, turn the corner, ah, oh, tiger on the path. What happens if there's a tiger on the path? Maybe where we are, it'd be a red-bellied black snake. What would it be for you? I don't know. Have you got any creatures? Shark. Shark. Okay, you're swimming out at bluff. <laughs> Very quickly, adenosine levels drop. Why does adenosine levels drop? Remember, these are some of the neurotransmitters. Adenosine levels drop. Well, adenosine is like the fuse box. And when you're in a crisis, fuse box has to go because you're going about to do the run or the climb of your life. Acetylcholine levels rise. Acet acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that has to do with the frontal lobe function and it rises when a person meets a tiger on the path. No wonder you're going to have to make some quick decisions. Do you think you can outrun the tiger? Do you think you can climb that tree? Can you get that? that rock and hit him on the head, do a David and Goliath. Can you see why this rises in a crisis? Dopamine is a neurotransmitter and it's the pursuit of reward, pursuit of happiness, the pursuit of escape. It rises when you meet a tiger on the path. But about half an hour later, the brain says, they're not running, they're not fighting, they're not... Because there's no tiger on the path. So brain says, and we've got this imbalance. Quick, develop extra neuro, extra little receptor sites for adenosine in an attempt to maintain the balance. Then the person comes to Misty Mountain Health Retreat and we don't serve any coffee and adenosine levels go back to normal and the receptor sites get flooded. Oh, does that hurt. People say, do you drink coffee, Barbara? I say, no, I just watch the people suffer. <laughs> Day one, Misty Mountain Health Retreat. But the good news is one lady said she had a headache for two weeks when she tried to do it at home. And when she came to our retreat, she only had a headache for 24 hours. And we did lots of things to her to help. Brain says, oh no, we've got an overload of acetylcholine. Stop making so much acetylcholine. So now frontal lobe function drops. Dopamine, week after week after month after month, dopamine <coughs> levels get exhausted. How would you feel if you met a tiger on the path every day for six months, three times a day for six months? There's a tiger on the path, so what? Gobble, gobble, gobble. <laughs> Do you know this is one of the causes of people having no energy? Hmm? When we 
we wake up in the morning, we should leap out of bed. Did everyone hear that? <laughs> if you don't, you've got to put the detective hat on. Is it because you ate too late? Is it because your bedroom's air is not great? Is it because you spent too much time on technology lace? You, is it because you're dehydrated? You've got to put the detective hat on and find out why. Because as the proverb says in 26 verse 2, the curse causeless shall not come. There is always a reason. Sugar causes a fuel imbalance in the brain. Caffeine causes a chemical imbalance in the brain. The hybridized wheat that gets the blood sugar level up higher and lower than even sugar causes a fuel imbalance. Mercury, what it does, it actually eats holes in the myelin sheath around the brain and that's a fatty sheath. Someone that has mercury fillings in their mouth, they're eating a lot of fish that's got mercury in it and they're on a fat-free diet, they're in danger because our brain is the fattiest organ in the body. Why do people drink another cup of coffee after they've had the cup of coffee? Well, they get the initial rise. It's like one lady said, oh, I love my coffee. Just gets my brain going and makes me feel good. Can you see that's the acetylcholine and the dopamine? But when the drop comes, that's when they reach for the other one. And if they have one straight after, they know they're going to get a drop and they're going to try and prevent the drop. Can you see that? <coughs> Mercury is a neurotoxin. There's no safe dose of this stuff. That's a good one-liner for your dentist. Did you know that dentists today in university are told that mercury is a poison? And it is. No safe dose of it. Why did they like it in dentistry? Because it's the only liquid metal and they amalgamate it so it moulds to the shape of the tooth. But one of the problems with mercury, and of course that's a big problem, that it's a neurotoxin, is it's bioaccumulative. What bioaccumulative means the longer it's in your fillings in your mouth, the more it's accumulating. And the bigger the fish, the larger the accumulation of the mercury. Also, alcohol. Alcohol is a neurotoxin, no safe dose of mercury, no safe dose of alcohol. In America, alcohol was banned from 1920 to 1933. It's called the prohibition. And the statistics around that time are quite amazing. Mental institution occupancy dropped to 8%. Jails were nearly empty. Domestic violence all, almost wiped out. No safe dose of that one. I was watching a documentary and it was interviewing paramedics and police. They said, we are called out to more alcohol-related incidents on a Friday and Saturday night than all the recreational drugs put together. And they said, and that's the legal one. <laughs> Mercury and alcohol kill brain cells. And once that brain cell's gone, it is gone. In healing the mind this afternoon, I will show you that there actually is a way to get new brain cells. Isn't that good news? Tobacco. Tobacco inhibits nutrients, water and oxygen to the brain. Now this is how it does that. Here is the carotid artery. You've got two carotid arteries going up there. They're the supply line to headquarters. What tobacco does is it weakens the arterial wall. Okay, students, what plugs that up? LDL cholesterol. And the damage keeps coming. So what's happening in the arterial wall? And as we looked at the other day, tobacco isn't the only thing that damages the arterial wall. Other things can damage it too. But in this illustration, we're looking at the tobacco. Tobacco also causes the blood cells to clump. Well, there's not a lot getting through there, is there? People that smoke will never attain to mental brilliance. What also inhibits frontal lobe function are drugs. Unfortunately, most recreational drugs also, many other uh, pharmaceutical drugs. One man told me he got depression after 
being on his diabetic medication for six months. Another man told me he got depression after a bypass. The anaesthetic gave it to him. Not everyone on diabetic medication will suffer like that. Not everyone who goes through surgery, but it's almost like playing Russian roulette. And also absolutely the recreational drugs. I'm surprised at how many people I meet who know someone in their immediate or extended circle of family and friends who knows a young person whose mind is damaged from recreational drugs. MSG, MSE's monosodium glutinate, causes the nerves on the, on the tongue to overfire so the food tastes fantastic. Do you know that's one of the main causes of food poisoning? Is people are eating rotten food and they don't know it because it tastes so good. It's scary, isn't it? You know what that means? A lump of mud would taste good. And what happens is MSG causes the nerve cells to overfire, not just on the tongue but everywhere, and they get exhausted and can die. Chemicals. We've got to get the chemicals out of our homes, out of our toothpaste, out of our shampoo, out of our food. <laughs> Get the little book, Chemical May. Start to investigate actually what you're eating, what you're wearing. This is a very socially acceptable list. No need for me to talk to you about the dangers of arsenic and cyanide. But there is definitely a need to talk about the dangers of this. But today, directly, it affects, I'm telling you, it directly affects the functioning of the frontal lobe. Now, when the frontal lobe goes down, you can't make the decisions that you're actually going to start rewiring your brain. Can you see that? But what also happens is late nights. No exercise. No exercise, you haven't got as much oxygen going to the brain. And if that brain cell has oxygen, it will give you 18 times more energy. Whoa. And it's something we'll pursue more when we look at depression this afternoon. A proper diet. How do you find the proper diet? You go to Genesis 1.29 where God's telling Adam and Eve what to eat. He says, Behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth. Herb bearing seed, that's your nuts, your seeds, your legumes, your lentils. Oh, that's what legumes are, grains. What about wheat? Unfortunately, the wheat today is not the wheat God made. In the 1950s, it was hybridised, and it's causing a whole lot of trouble. But there are so many other grains. You can get ancient grains, which are from the original wheat, like spelt and kamut. Your vegetables, your fruits, that's the best food. Water. Our brain's a hydroelectric system. No hydro, no water. This weather is the hardest time to drink water, isn't it? I just say, it's time, Barbara, drink. <laughs> Feelings go, oh, but I don't feel like drinking. <laughs> Frontal lobe says, you got a hydroelectric system. If you don't drink water, you'll... can you see that? So just do it. Don't wait till you're thirsty. Do you know in chronic dehydration, you lose the thirst signal? You just got to do it. Trust in divine power. When we're anxious, when we're upset, when we're fearful, you know, it inhibits frontal lobe function. There are two opposites in our brain. One is faith and one is fear. And from fear come all the negative emotions. And God gave us a lovely verse to counteract fear. It's 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 where God says, I've not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, of love and of a sound mind. And over here we've got faith, and the verse for faith is Hebrews 11 verse 1, where it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of not thing, things not seen. If you can see it, it's not faith. <laughs> Have faith in this amazing body that has the ability to heal itself. Have faith in this brain that can actually be rewired right up until the day you die. Now, if you've been inspired by the lectures, and been doing everything right this week, you've only got two more weeks and you're in the habit. <laughs> you're in the habit. You can rewire your brain. That's the good news. It's very good news. This brain cell has the ability to develop 70,000 dendrites. Whoa! How do we develop new dendrites? This is actually not just habits. This is developing other things, learning something new. 
And A.A. Milne, the poet, he said, the world is full of so many things, we all should be as happy as kings. Play music. Learn to, learn to skate, learn to ski, learn to ride a bike. You're learning how to lymphosize. <laughs> learn to play the recorder. You may not be able to afford one of these, but everyone can get a recorder. Sorry, triangle's out. <laughs> Maybe it's a good start. Can you paint? Can you cook? Can you sew? My husband's not interested in knitting and sewing. <laughs> but six years ago, he learned to fly a helicopter. Well, he, he developed a lot of dendrites. You can be developing new dendrites right up until the day you die. Oh, the tragedy is that most people go through their whole life never fully accessing the power of the brain. Mm -hmm. You can be anything you want to be. Where there's a will, there's a way. I would love to be a pianist, but I recognise that my time and my memory has to go into other things. I have to learn constantly new things. I'm constantly memorising things so that I can be an effective deliverer for you. <laughs> and I trust inspire you to learn more things. So you can see that you can be rewiring your brain. Make sure you go to bed early. Make sure you exercise. Make sure you drink your water. Make sure you start learning those wonderful little Bible verses. One is 26, Isaiah 26 verse 3, where it says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, he whose mind is stayed upon thee, because he trusteth in thee. But when you give your frontal lobe to God, you go one step further. You've got divine help. Divine help to give you strength to make the decisions that you want to make. And there's a lovely verse in a book. I think this is a little book called um, Council on Diet and Food, page 30. And it says, right physical habits promote mental superiority. Intellectual power, physical strength, longevity depend upon immutable laws. There's no happen so no chance about this matter. Nature's God will not interfere to preserve men from the consequences of violating nature's law. There is much sterling truth in the adage, every man and every woman is the architect of their own fortune. Isn't that true? So let me finish with a verse from Proverbs, and it's Proverbs 22, verse 17. Bow down thine ear and hear the words of the wise, and apply thine heart to my knowledge. For it is a pleasant thing, if you keep them within thee, because they withal shall be fitted in thy lips. You see, what we take into our mind comes out in our lips. Have not I made known unto you this day? Have not I written unto you excellent things in counsel and in knowledge, that you might know the certainty of the words of truth? that you might be able to give an answer to them that ask you. Because they're going to say to you, how come you look so good? Well, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> how come you've lost weight? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Do you know, that is the time that you can speak. So ladies and gentlemen, I trust you are inspired to take this frontal lobe. <laughs> give it the right conditions. Don't put anything that will harm it. Give it to the great God of heaven and then start planning what you're going to learn next. Start planning the habits that you want to develop. Start looking at the habits you want to stop because where there's a will, there's a way. Thank you.